Um, okay, so yeah, welcome um, to another one of our Landscapes Live uh, seminar series. Um, today we have, are delighted to invite uh, Dr. Anne Rowan uh, to speak um, about her recent uh, research. Anne Rowan is a Royal Society um, Dor uh, Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow uh, at the University of Sheffield, but will soon be moving to uh, Bergen. So congratulations, Anne, for the new post. Um, and so for the next 40 or so minutes, Anne will talk about her recent research uh, entitled Rethinking Ice Marginal Moraines as a Record of Terrestrial Paleoclimate Change. Um, okay, so Anne, whenever you're ready, uh, please feel free to start. I will continue to let a sort of other uh, stragglers into the chat just for everyone's notice um, we will be uh, the chat won't be active uh, during uh, Anne's talk but we will activate it five minutes or so before she finishes speaking so please feel free to post your questions there and then the rest of the landscapes live uh, uh, team will then uh, moderate the chat and we can ask Anne all of our questions okay thank you very much Anne. Thanks Lizzie. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we can use moraines to understand past climate change, but, but by doing so, how we need to think about how glaciers behave as the climate changes, as well as just seeing them as a filter of a climate signal. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start with a brief introduction um, and an example from New Zealand, and then I'm going to talk about some numerical modelling work that we've been doing to try and look at how moraine, glaciers build moraines as a function of climate change, and then um, go back to the field and talk about New Zealand, about Nepal and these beautiful moraines you can see on this title slide and a geochronology we've just produced for um, the Upper Kumbu Valley. But to start with, now I need to make sure my slides are moving. Okay, so to start with some, some big picture background, um, in terms of thinking about how climate has changed during the Quaternary, we have various proxy records that we use. But the majority of these come from marine or lacustrine sediment cores or from polar ice cores. And as a result of this, their geographical range is limited. And this limits our ability to understand how climate has varied over, over space, which is difficult if we're trying to think about things like why the poles or high, high elevations are warming more rapidly than the global mean. So what these um, the figure on the left shows is sea surface temperature records, um, from across the globe for the last glacier maximum in the late Holocene. And you can see that there's fairly good coverage there. And on the right, this plot um, uh, shows a, a, a data compilation of um, temperature records for the Holocene um, and the distribution of those by latitude. And you can see that um, there's actually very poor um, representation in this data set below 30 degrees north. And that most of these data points are um, below 30 degrees north are from sea, are from marine sediment. So they record sea surface temperature rather than temperature at any other elevation. So I think there are gaps in, in our understanding of past climate that we need to address to be able to understand better how climate has varied in the past. And particularly these gaps are at non-polar latitudes in the southern hemisphere at high elevations and across the continents. So we know relatively more about um, paleo temperature across the oceans than we do across the um, land surface of the earth. And I think, and so the, one of the ways we can do this is look for different proxy records rather than those that um, are summarized on this slide. We need a proxy record that fits these criteria of being in a different type of location. And one, and a really great potential proxy is moraines. So ice marginal moraines created in glaciated landscapes record past glacial extent. And glaciers often respond sensitively to climate change and they filter the climate signals of changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, changes in seasonality. And um, they respond relatively slowly, but they do build, build moraines that maybe record how, of, how much often the climate has changed on a sort of decadal or centennial scale. And by looking at glacier landforms, we can then understand how much and how often glaciers have changed. We can use geochronological techniques such as uh, luminescence or cosmogenic nuclide exposure age dating to understand when these changes have occurred and how rapidly. And then we often use glacier reconstruction, either using empirical methods such as looking at the geometry of a glacier surface that we can infer from moraines or infer inverse glacier climate modeling to infer a climatic forcing of that change in glacier extent compared to the present day. And the figure here shows 
um, a compilation of um, cosmogenic nuclide exposure age dated moraines um, from mountain glaciers. This is from a paper by Greg Balco, and these data are collected in his um, ICD database. And you can see that the geographical distribution of moraine ages spans a really wide range of latitudes and also elevations. So this is really useful, and the map on, in, in the inset shows this really useful potential proxy of paleoclimate in the places that we currently have fairly poor information. And this is, you know, this is a well-established field. Paleoglaciologists have been reconstructing glaciers, dating moraines, and trying to infer climate from, the, from them for many, many years. But what I think we need to do is be a bit more critical about what a moraine actually tells us in terms of how it records how the glacier responds to climate change. So here's, I'll talk you through an example of this, this approach. Um, and then I'll talk about um, what, you know, how we've been exploring this in more detail. So this is um, a paper by Aaron Putnam and colleagues looking at the deglaciation of the Rakaia Valley in the central southern Alps of New Zealand. So the Rakaia is just here. This is the centre of South Island. And this is a really key southern hemisphere location for investigating quaternary paleoclimate. So the, um, New Zealand is one of the few land masses in the temperate mid-latitudes of the southern hemisphere. The southern Alps were extensively glaciated during the quaternary and there's a really rich um, ge geomorphological record of past glacier change here. So it's potentially really, really useful. And um, this mapping, um, this is mapping of the quaternary geology in great detail. Um, and then um, in this paper, Aaron Putnam produced a, um, a, a brilliant 10 geochronology for the moraines in this valley, which you can see here. So the large number of dates from a set of moraines recording the deglaciation from the last glacier maximum, which reached to the range front about here. And this is one of the largest, um, largest paleo glaciers in the Southern Alps. And it's flowing from the east of the Southern Alps. So it's, um, it's, it's really useful as a potential climate proxy. And then what we, so what the, um, the ages show is about halving of the length of the Rakaia glacier between 18,000 years ago when it was at the range front and 16,000 years ago. And to move back up here to Prospect Hill. And then we used a glacier model to reconstruct those extents. Which could, excuse me, um, and to make steady state simulations of the glacier um, to match the positions of the moraines that have been dated um, using beryllium 10. And what this shows is that the LGM position, so the dashed lines show um, inferred previous um, ice extents, and the, the blue shading shows the ice thickness simulated to match the moraines that have been dated. And what we get from this is a two degree change in temperature between 18 and 16,000 years ago between these two simulations. So, and so that tells us not only how fast the Rakaia deglaciated, but what the change in temperature was that was required to, to make this happen. And if we compile these results then, so this is the Rakaia deglaciation um, showing time on the x-axis. So that's from the beryllium 10 ages and then temperature from the glacier modeling below to below present day values. So each one of these crosses relates to one set of moraines. This is um, the deglaciation in that paper um, combined with results from a subsequent paper by Toby Kaufman. And, and what it shows is that the, the Rakaia, um, the ice mass in the Rakaia declined rapidly during Heinrich Stadial one in the Northern hemisphere um, and then stabilized during the Antarctic cold reversal and then started to decline again Oh, excuse me, my children are giving me a cold. Um, during Heinrich's Edward Zero, so the younger Dryas in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is interesting because it shows um, that um, a potential warming in the Southern Hemisphere at the same time as cooling in the Northern Hemisphere. And this correlates with movement of the subtropical front, which is this warm current that goes around New Zealand and controls the position, ocean current that controls the position of the westerlies. So what this suggests is that um, the transfer of heat through the ocean um, affects climate, the, the, the rate of cooling or warming between the hemispheres. And that this, this is all inferred from, um, a, a geo, from a set of moraines in, in the Southern hemisphere, but with comparison to similar events in the Northern hemisphere. And um, there's a very nice paper by George Denton in QSR last year that summarized this probably more clearly than I am doing by, by looking at compiling moraine records for, um, for, glaci for glaciers in the, southern, in the south southern Alps and looking at how that compared to the timing of change in CO2 
and um, and finding that the warming in the northern in the southern hemisphere appears to be something that pushes the climate towards an interglacial condition out of a out of a glacial and then the co2 rises out later slightly later on okay so i think that's a really nice example of how we can use moraines to infer paleoclimate and how paleoclimate has changed over a relatively short amount of time um then the next stage of the talk i'm going to talk about where, how how reliable moraines are as a record of past climate, bearing in mind that glacier dynamics and feedbacks with topography affect how glaciers can change as the climate changes and how they form moraines. So as I see it, there's two problems in using moraines as a, as a direct proxy of climate and assuming that every moraine represents something meaningful about climate change. So firstly, glaciers are non-linear in their response to climate change, particularly mountain glaciers flowing through high relief topography and get feedbacks with topography, feedbacks with weather systems, glaciers can develop debris layers or ice marginal lakes, and all of these things affect their behavior. And the second problem, <coughs> excuse me, is that glaciers can, the sedimentary record created by glaciers is not always complete. So as, as is the case with most geological records. So glaciers can fluctuate without building moraines, but they can also remove or overprint moraines formed by previous glaciation. As a result, it's possible that larger events are more likely to be preserved than smaller events, and this could give us a an, an, an misleading interpretation of how climate has changed if, we, if it just looks like there's been a, few, a small number of large glaciations rather than those have been interspersed with more smaller changes in glacier mass, or indeed more changes of the same magnitude that have been overprinted by subsequent events. So if we look at, if we, to explain these two problems in a little more detail, um, in the first one, this is a really nice figure from a commentary article um, comparing the uh, a piece of research looking at beryllium 10 ages for moraines produced across North America by the two large ice sheets um, during the last glacier maximum deglaciation. I'm just comparing the deglaciation of the Cordilleran ice sheet, which occupied the west coast of the, uh, North America and across the high relief topography of the Rocky Mountains. And the Laurentide ice sheet, which was in the centre of the continent and flowed over lower relief, much flatter to, for terrain. So the, the, the behaviour of both ice sheets, despite occurring over the same time scale, and so in response to a similar climate forcing, the behaviour differed because of the effect of the topography on the glacier, on the, on the bed. And the similar processes occur with ice sheets. So as, they, as these North America deglaciated, the ice sheet started to interact with the topography, um, and the ice margin started to interact with the topography, and small glaciers formed at high elevation in the Cordilleran, whereas the Laurentide deglaciated more smoothly. Um, during an advance about 14,000 years ago, the sequences of moraines formed as a result of this topographic feedback on ice flow differed significantly between the two ice masses. And then as they deglaciated to the start of the Holocene, um, a much more complex sequence of moraines was formed the, by the by the declining Cordilleran ice sheet compared to the Laurentide, which had a fairly straightforward um, sequence of moraines. So, if you were thinking about which one it gives you a most reliable record of paleoclimate forcing of glacier of ice sheet change, you might want to look at this example with the simple the simpler topographic controls. But what we also see is so jumping back to to mountain glaciers is that we see, we see a similar thing with different sizes of mountain glaciers. So this is an example, oh, excuse me. My voice was holding up really well until I started this talk. Um, so we if we look comparing three different, the length changes for three different mountain glaciers in the Swiss Alps. Um, small glaciers, so this is over the same period of time. So assuming a similar um, climate forcing, Small glaciers fluctuate more frequently than large glaciers during deglaciation. And if we think about what that means in terms of moraine formation, if we assume that every time a glacier, an ice margin expands and then stabilizes or recedes, it builds a moraine. There's going to be a larger number of moraines built by a smaller glacier with a more rapidly fluctuating margin. And in this case, we also assume that the uh, 
the so the red points show where moraines are form, formed and preserved, and the white points show where moraines are, would potentially be formed and removed because the glacier advances over that position again, and so probably could could remove that moraine form during a subsequent glaciation. Okay. So, okay, I'll be back in one second. Okay, back. <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> trying to manage this. Um, okay, so what we what we've done to think about this problem is use instead of using an inverse model as we've seen in the New Zealand example and is commonly used in paleoglaciological studies, is use a forward model of marine building. So starting from a synthetic alpine landscape that hasn't been previously glaciated, so a fluvial sort of landscape, and running a glacier model over that, that includes the transport and deposition of sediment to look at how moraines would form under a different set of simplified climate forcings. Um, so this is using the ISOCIA um, higher order ice flow model developed by David Egham. And what's novel about this application of the model is it includes the reentrainment of sediment. So the glacier erodes its bed by abrasion, produces sediment that is then transported and deposited at the ice margins. What also happens is that the glacier can reentrain that sediment by regulation if it flows over the moraine. So effectively it can also, as well as building moraines, it can also erode and retransport sediments that has previously been deposited. And that's important for understanding marine sequences. So I'll show you some of the results from this. So this is the, the first example. Okay, well, actually on the first, the very first example is this one, I guess, where I show you. So this is a steady state simulation. So this is the starting point for the simulations I will show you in the next slides. And this steady state glacier builds a single moraine. And the moraine is represents um, this point indicated by the white star, which is the maximum extent that the glacier advances to. So that's great. That moraine is a really clear record of how the glacier has changed or not changed in this case over time. It's a clear indicator of a climatic control on ice extent. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this example, this is what happens when you take the same setup, so the same um, the same steady state glacier extent, but then impose interannual variability in climate onto that fixed climate signal. So rather than the, the, this is the climatic forcing, rather than just this just being a straight line of a fixed temperature, there's a little bit of variability. So it's one and a half degrees in, as a standard deviation of mean annual temperature every year. And that's equivalent, that's meant to represent not a change in climate, but interannual variability in weather, say, between each year. So some years a little bit warmer, some a little bit colder. And to see what that means in terms of marine building. And what... <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and this is similar to um, some experiments by um, Leif Anderson in his um, 2014 paper where he looked at how um, white noise, so climate interannual variability in climate, can affect um, the length change of a glacier. The difference here is that we include sediment deposition. And this um, turns out to be important because the, as the glacier flu margin fluctuates very slightly over time, so I'll show you the final results from the simulation. So the, the animation on the left will keep running, um, and the, but the figure on the right shows you the end result of this. This is what the moraines look like at the end of the simulation. And you can see that there's three different moraines built, quite closely spaced, but three distinct crests. Um, the dotted lines show you the smaller crests, and the dashed line here shows you the largest crest, which just about represents the maximum glacier extent. And um, this shows you the temperature forcing, this as in the same as in the in the simulation that's running on the left. This shows the mass balance response to that. So each dot is one year's mass balance, and the black line is the 10-year running mean of that. And then this, these plots at the bottom show the ice volume and ice margin change over time, and the change in the sediment covered area and the maximum height of the moraine over the same time. And the gray shaded bars show periods of moraine building when the glaciers depositing sediments to form distinct crests that, um, that appear to be ice marginal moraines. And what's interesting is that there can be a moderately large ice margin excursion even in the absence of any real change in climate. And that this is driven by 
the deposition of sediment at the ice margin that just forces the glacier back a little. So it it's, um, raises the bed, um, creates a barrier, and the, uh, the glacier loses a little bit of mass at its terminus and then recedes slightly. So the sequence, it's not a sequence of processional moraines, but it is generally tending to shrink. The, uh, the, the moraines are tending to be built in sequence up valley until the glacier overcomes that a little and advances slightly again to the outer position. So the result of this simulation is it shows that even without a change in climate, you can get three moraines, three distinct moraines built by a glacier that's just fluctuating in response to interannual variability. Okay, so now we'll look at some simulations with that that force a larger change as a, a meaningful change in climate. So this one is looking at what happens when a glacier advances. This is a 2000 year simulation with a step change in climate every 100 years. And this is important because the response time of this glacier is about 180 years. So in these in the next two simulations, I'll show you the response time of the glacier is longer than the rate of climate change. So the glacier is always out of balance with climate. In this case, it advances. So that simulation is running again and builds a moraine here, but it doesn't reach the maximum position that it would do if it was in balance with climate, but it builds a significant moraine, slightly further, somewhat further up valley than just one moraine. Anne, can I just um, uh, jump in just one second? Yeah. Pause, pause. So I've started re-recording now. Oh, recording again. Okay, yeah. so let's go to the next slide. So this is then similar to the previous slide. Um, a change in climate shorter than that's occurring more rapidly than the glacier response time. But this is looking at a cycling of climate. Um, so the glacier is going through two warming cooling cycles. And um, the result of this is that it still builds um, a similar moraines, uh, one a similar number of moraines, but they're in a different position to the, the advanced sequence. So what this shows here is that the glacier starts at the maximum extent um, and any, moraine, any sediments deposited there doesn't form a significant moraine because it immediately recedes. And then the over two cycles, the glacier builds a, the largest terminal moraine is built here in the middle of the valley, which is a slightly further up valley than that built during an advance with a similar amount of rate of climate change. Um, and there's also a couple of smaller moraines formed here. So then if we compare this with the result of um, a similar simulation that takes same two warming cooling cycles but changes the rate of climate change and makes it 10 times longer so that it's longer than the glacier response time we can see that that's going to result that will result in quite a different marine sequence so in this case the glacier is moving through a 20,000 year simulation with two warming cooling cycles so each step change is a thousand years and the two the moraines that are built have a quite different geometry to that where the rate of climate change is shorter than the response time. So here the rate of climate change is longer than the response time. And the glacier does advance and build a moraine at the maximum extent. So here where you'd expect, as, as we see in the steady state simulation, but it's not the largest moraine. The highest relief moraine is built here further up valley. And this is more topographically controlled. So this the position of this moraine uh, is 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 where the tributary glaciers merge and reach the so the lower lower slope topography in the valley floor, and here the glacier through um, a series of advances and recessions builds the largest moraine. And you can see from these plots that the periods of moraine building cluster around the advances, as you'd expect when the glacier expands, but that the glacier builds different moraines at different times. So they're numbered by these letters T one. T1 is the first moraine built, T3 is the third moraine built, and so on. Okay, so then one more of these simulations to look at recession. So this is again a 20,000 year simulation where the um, climate forcing is longer than the response time. And look at what happens if the glacier recedes from its maximum um, over time in a stepped recession. And what happens here is this is sequence where you get the most complete record of each change in climate. So there isn't a moraine built at the maximum position because the glacier recedes immediately from there. If you'd started with an advance to that position, then there would be a moraine here. But for each step change in climate, the glacier margin stabilizes, builds a moraine, and then recedes again. And it doesn't remove those moraines because, um, because it, doesn't, it doesn't advance again to that position. 
So again, the dotted lines show where marine crests are formed and the dashed lines show where the largest moraines are formed, the highest relief moraines. And the three highest relief moraines, one, two, three here, don't, and they're T3, T4, T5, they don't represent the maximum extent of the glacier, they represent the topographic control where the, the, the ice margin stabilizes um, where the trend where the tributary glaciers are bringing in a large amount of sediments that can be compiled into into these moraines and the, the glacier continues to build moraines as it recedes except for when it gets right back to its headwaters right back to the cirques where there isn't enough sediment available for very small glaciers to build moraines so in each of these maps um, where there's where you can't see any any of the blue shading that's where there's no sediment accumulating but what this um so this simulation is probably the most accurate record in terms of a paleoclimate sequence. And this is similar to those that we saw in the Rakaya Valley. This is a recessional sequence built by a, marine, a mountain glacier responding to climate change more rapidly that is on a longer time scale in its response time. Oh dear. <coughs> yeah. Okay, I will keep going. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to talking about an example from the field. So having presented the forward modeling, um, now I'm going to talk about understanding um, glacier change in the Himalaya. So this is the Kumbu Valley in Nepal, where we've been working for several years looking at how these glaciers respond to climate change. And the moraine sequences here are really beautiful and they're really interesting, um, but they can be these um, high relief moraines created by sediment by glaciers that are transporting large amounts of sediments so in a tectonically active high you know landscape with a high rate of erosion they can be difficult to interpret as a as a record of glacier change or paleoclimate change because the, these moraines are big they're not very stable and um, they're very they're often very closely spaced so these are the Fariche last glacier maximum moraines built by Kumbu glacier that um have been previously um, studied and dated by Lewis Owen and Robert Finkel. And I'll show you some results from their work. And then we've been working further up Valley to look at the Holocene moraines. And I should say that this is work by Josephine Hornsey as part of her PhD that she's just finishing up now um, at Sheffield. And this is, um, this is as she did, this, as she did the field and lab work to produce the geochronology that I'm going to show you in the next few slides. And this is um, the pre-existing geochronology for the Kumbu Valley. So this is from um, um, Finkel et al. 2003, um, but these have been recalibrated um, to, be in, uh, to be in line with present day production rates and with our samples. And they identified a set of, of glacial stages um, and these are the key ones, the two different LGM stages and then three subsequent Holocene stages or one in the start of the Holocene, one in the middle and one more recent. And um, this photo shows what these moraines look like. So these moraines are huge. This is the terminal moraine complex of the Kumbu Glacier. And it's about 250 meters high. There's someone circled in the red for scale. And did, um, you can see the terminal moraines um, are a sequence. Are, there's probably two moraine crests in there that we can identify. And if we look at um, the lateral moraines instead, so moving up valley, looking down from here, in the lateral moraines, you can see these two crests as well. But as I'll show you slightly later on, there's a more detailed sequence in the lateral moraines than the terminal moraines, which is why we chose to examine them for dating. I'm just going to go off again. <coughs> okay, try again. Um, so let's look at the geochronology for the upper Kumbu Valley. So on the previous slide, this is the this is the area that was undated for the more proximal to the glacier. And this is where we've been working and Joe has, has collected samples to look at the ages of the lateral moraines surrounding the Kumbu Glacier and the Changri Nup Glacier, which was a former tributary of the Kumbu until fairly recently, and the Lobrichet Glacier, which is a much smaller glacier with a set of lateral and terminal moraines that are distinct from those formed by Kumbu Glacier. So um, we used beryllium 10 dating to look at these samples and they're, they're relatively young, but um, the precision on these measurements was high. So that's good, that allows us to distinguish them. And if we look at the results in a little more detail, so for each of the four sites shown in the location map, these are the results that we got. Um, the Changri Nut Moraines are, fall into two groups. There's one 
which is very, which is um, LGM or older. And there's some very recent moraines, which are little ice age equivalents. And then these are this is the Kumbu, the lateral moraines of the Kumbu glacier that I showed you in the photo. And we dated a set around 7,000 years and a set around 1,000 years. And these are the Lobouche moraines. So this is a lateral terminal moraine set that appears to have three, three distinct crests. And we got a lot of samples from those that I'll show you the ages of in a second. So this is the compiled chronology for the, both glaciers, showing the timing of moraine formation, um, indicated by the exposure ages. And the bars show the uh, the local glacial stages identified by Finkel and Epping. <coughs> If any of my co-authors are in the audience, they could take over presenting at this point, um, but I will keep going. Um, so what we see is we, we identified seven different marine building events from, um, from this sequence, which is summarized here, seven different Holocene events. And the, la the late Holocene is fairly complicated, but does seem to fall out the Changbi Nup, which is the, uh, the Little Ice Age Kumbu, Kumbu tributary, the Lobouche, and the Kumbu too. So there are these different events are identified from different from the moraines built by different glaciers, but in response to the same change in climate. And then these are the older ages from the Little Ice Age uh, Changri Nut Glacier. And then we compared those with um, regional stages identified um, in a previous paper for the monsoon influenced Himalaya. Um, so Murari et al. 2014 identified um, stages they called Mohits. Um, and a lot, and it's not, these, these are, each one of these is a different glacial event that I did, they identified for a compilation of marine ages across the monsoon influenced Himalaya. And these match up with our chronology. So of the, the, the six Kumbu moraines and the Changri Nut moraine, which was a tributary of the Kumbu at that point, we identify that each of those stages that have been identified regionally in this valley. And then the Kumbu 7 moraine, um, which we, it comes out which um, we've we mapped but didn't um, take sample for dating we assigned to the Chukung stage from um, Finkel et al which is about the start of the Holocene but it could it could also represent one of these uh, one of these later stages but we don't have the ages for that and then the um, the, Chang the older Changri Nup samples come out about the same age as the Fariche one moraines But this is where it gets a bit more complicated. So the lateral moraine sequence, this is the Kumbu lateral moraines again, they showed you in the previous slide. So this is the Kumbu 2 moraine here. This is the Kumbu 6 moraine here that we dated. But moving up towards, um, up, so this is further up the ablation area of the glacier towards where it's, con where the confluence with the Changri Nut Glacier was, we see a larger number of moraines represented in the landform record. <laughs> So here, this is a photo looking at looking into these moraines, and this is an, an annotation of that photo to show that we think we can identify each of those moraines, each of those timing moraine building events that we identified for the Lobush, for the combined Lobuche and Kumbu geochronology for the Kumbu glacier. So we can identify moraines three, four, and five, which sit in between two and six, but are only represented here, and then are vanish beneath the Kumbu two moraine further down valley. And this is a cross section to show what that would look like. So this is cross section is drawn um, to indicate what this would look like here, where you can see each moraine exposed at the surface. And then further down valley towards the terminus of the glacier, the cross section would look a little bit more like this. And you'd see, so this is the glacier side, this is the lateral moronic trough. And some of those moraines are lost beneath the Kumbu two moraine. So it, as you only see two moraines at this point, which are really clear. And further up, you get a more complex sequence of six moraines, what well, five moraines, and then the inner one, which is the little the little ice age, which we didn't date, but probably represents the last hundred years or so of recession. Okay, so I'm going to stop soon because I think I'm getting there. But I've shown you some examples of a model of how glaciers build moraines over short time scales and over landscapes that have not initially been glaciated and some um, 
on moraines, moraine sequences built, Holocene moraine sequences built by glaciers with complex um, responses to climate change and complex marine geomorphologies. So thinking about where this goes, the, the sort of limitations of this work or where to go next, um, it's important to bear in mind that the, the moraine sequences in the model are, are built on a, on a fluvial topography. So um, thinking about the preconditioning of glacial landscapes, which was explored by Pedersen Egghome in their 2013 paper, as a landscape becomes glaciated through multiple glacial cycles, the geometry of that landscape changes. So the hypsometry changes such that it affects the extent of glaciation. And um, one of the results from their paper was that a pre an unglaciated landscape could be the most straightforward way of recording climate change in terms of changing glacier length relating directly to climate change, which is what we did in our simulations. But it's often not the case that a landscape hasn't been previously glaciated when we go and investigate it to look at moraines. So these feedbacks between rock uplift, glacial erosion and moraine building over quaternary timescales are likely to result in different um, moraine sequences than those that we've seen in the model. And those are the sort of processes need to be incorporated to look at longer term glacier landscape evolution, how that's recorded in the sedimentary record. Um, topographic complexity varies um, between ice sheets and glaciers and between different landscapes. So that's going to have an effect on moraine sequences and that's important to bear in mind when thinking about how, how well moraines record glacier change compared to climate change. And so over, over time, um, glaciers erode their beds. And so they, they set up a self-defeating behavior whereby if the rate of erosion outpaces rock uplift, the ELA reduces and the glacier um, can't advance as far in the subsequent glaciation as it has done in the previous one, which is the far flung moraines hypothesis um, in, by Anderson et al, 2012. And that you know, demonstrates why pre-LGM moraines are often much further down valley than, than LGM moraines and they're banned more likely to be preserved. So the preservation and formation of moraines is, is dependent on the evolution of the landscape and over quaternary time scales, rock uplift is going to be an important part of that, but that's not yet considered in our model. That's hopefully the next thing to do, but I'm happy to discuss ideas. Um, and then, so just to conclude, um, moraine building affects subsequent glacier change. And our model results show that a glacier may build several distinct moraines with no change in climate due to sediment accumulating near the terminus. And also that um, for Kumbu Glacier, for example, debris covered glaciers um, can, show, can develop a different moraine sequence to a clean ice glacier. Moraine sequences formed during periods of recession may be the most reliable glacier records of paleoclimate change. And the example for that is the Rakaya Valley in the Southern Alps. But complete moraine sequences can also be identified where mass change is less straightforward, but it does require careful interpretation of landforms and their ages. So the example for this is the Kumbu Valley in Nepal. And there I will stop. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Anne. Um, I think I can speak for all of us when I say well done. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry you haven't been feeling very well, but you've done an absolute stellar job of getting through it. So thank you very much. Um, for those of you who didn't see, um, the chat is now open, so please feel free uh, to start uh, posting your questions and we will um, read them out. I, before people start posting their questions, um, I have a quick question, um, Anne, about um, uh, some of your field examples and certainly your Holocene um, moraines. Could you say something about how you think um, the duration of moraine formation and then the Cosmo ages that you then have for, for those landforms you know how do we if we're talking about very short time scales um what are your thoughts then on linking those marine ages to actual climatic events or saying something about uh, paleo climate i don't know whether i've communicated that effectively i guess i'm talking about how long do these moraines take to form and how might that affect the way you interpret your marine ages yeah no i think that's a good question so let me go back to that this figure um So we think, so if we look at um, each, of, so these are each of the events for the, from our Kumbu chronology, they are sufficiently, you know, sufficiently far apart. So if we look at the table, there's about a thousand years between events um, that we'd expect to be longer than the response time. So from glacier modeling, the response time of Kumbu is about 250 years. 
So we'd expect that the you know over this time scale we are these moraines are recording the difference between the moraine ages records changes in glacier in the in the glacier mass that stabilize and before it responds to a subsequent change in climate. A possible exception to that is the Lobuchet two moraine, which we mapped as one moraine, and then the ages fall out as as they do come out as two distinct events. So uh, which we then separate into Lobuchet two B and two A. Um, because they, they are different, including in taking into account their uncertainties. But it could be that these, so the samples, let me get this the right way around. Um, the Lobuchet 2, so it's this, this moraine in the middle. The slightly older samples are, more, are closer to the terminus than the younger samples, which are more on the lateral moraine. So it could be that this represents a time transgressive moraine building rather than two different moraine building events. Yeah, it's difficult yeah it takes a bit of thinking about <laughs> yeah no that's great thank you um so we have one question uh, in the chat and um, so it says um older moraine boulder exposure ages so pre-lgm tend to correspond well with cold events in the past usually uh, interpreted as ice advances but since the last deglaciation at 19,000 uh, years ago it's more linked to warming events such as co2 rising so how can we better understand exposure age uh, how do we understand how exposure ages, what they really represent? Mm. Um, let me think about this. Well, so I think it be, I think, I mean, if uh, since the end of the last glacier maximum, which is effectively what 19,000 Ka and onwards is, um, the glaciers worldwide have receded. So any any moraine dated after that, you know, from that's younger than that is going to be a deglaciation moraine most likely. Um, but then you have to, then that doesn't necessarily tell you what is causing the climate to change. So I think linking it to CO2, um, they're saying that the exposure age is a product of a, of a change in, in CO2 is sort of maybe an overinterpretation. So I think it's important to think about why glaciers are changing and that over that time scale, it probably is to do with climate change, unless they have a particularly um, distinctive behavior that's that's very topographically controlled. But um, but the time, so the difference in time scale, I think is important. So if you're looking at cold events, so glacia, glaciations prior to the LGM, the time scale is less well constrained, and you know, if we whereas if we're looking at deglaciation over the last twenty thousand years, it becomes more, you know, the ages become more precise, and the events become easier to differentiate. So I think that it's it's more that the record is a better res has a better resolution as we come more towards the present day than it has a different driver. But um, again, other you know, that's maybe something we could discuss if anyone else has an opinion. <laughs> Uh, no, that's great. Thank you. And then we've got um, Banu uh, Pratap in the in the chat has just raised uh, their hand. Did you want to turn on your microphone or post your question? Uh, hi, Robert. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I really follow your research. Uh, I'm from India, Goa, uh, in the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research. We're working on Himalaya. Actually, it's not a question, it's a query, actually. So we are working on a Western Himalayan glaciers and actually we are dealing with a, a different kind of glacier. So what if there is a debris of glacier, which I know that uh, is a transition phase between the clean, the healthy glacier and the rock, the dead glacier. So in our basin, we found all three kinds of the glaciers and uh, uh, not only three, but uh, the fourth, which is Lake Terminate Glacier. So we are dealing with how to uh, measure the response of all those glaciers towards the climate variation because their morphology is different, their ablation pattern is different. So that was the, you know, that was the objective I'm dealing with it. It's really, really, you know, hard to quantify it. So I just want to ask you how I can answer those questions. Um, well, they're, yeah, so they're difficult questions. So how, um, how so glaciers, for example, with a lake that terminate in a lake compared to the ones that terminate on land, they're going to behave differently in response to the same change in climate. So I think the important thing is, if you're looking, are you looking at 
place your change over in, in the net in the future rather than over sort of the Holocene presumably you're looking at what happens now the lake has formed yeah that's true yeah yeah so it's um you need I think you need to consider the evolution of each glacier separately in that case there's it's there's people working on how to generalize the interaction of glaciers with the lakes but it will depend on the geometry of the lake the geometry of the bed of the glacier and whether it's um how long the ice margin will stay in contact with it so there's a really nice paper by Jenna Sutherland in, in GRL looking at glacier lake interactions in New Zealand, which show that once and this is over a longer time scale, this is um, LGM deglaciation. But once a glacier develops a lake, the margin can recede very rapidly until it's out of contact with the lake. But that the longer term, the climate is regulating the extent of the glacier. So it may, you know, once it, for an individual individual glacier that forms a proglacial lake that's its evolution will be very much controlled by the amount of time it's in contact with a lake which is affected by the geometry of the glacier and its bed so it's difficult to generalize for that and i think um yeah and the other than that it's really useful particularly for understanding how glaciers will evolve in future to use a, a model that includes the dynamic behaviors and the important feedbacks for example for a debris covered glacier that allow the debris layer to evolve and see how that affects mass balance because you will get a different difference in evolution for it as a debris layer develops compared to a clean ice glacier. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Anne today? I have I have another question, Anne, if, if that's possible. Um, so um, I have a question about you, the modeling side of things. Um, and you talked about the uh, Egon uh, 2011 model and how you're, from my understanding, then the glacier erodes the bed, you pick up that sediment and then you can get the model to pick it up and, and dump it again and things like that. Um, does it also factor in um, slope processes or is this purely sediment that's generated in the subglacial realm and then that's what's being moved forward and, 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 and dumped, or is there other sources of sediment in that? No, no so it's a very simple model at the moment, isn't it? The sediment, the sediment, oh <coughs> dear, the only sediment in the model is that which is produced by um, abrasion of the bed. But um, you're right, it's moraines are not just a product of subglacial erosion, there's deposition of sediment superglacially and transport of that um, from the hill slopes. So this is something we should we should include next. and. You know, look at it'd be really useful to know if anyone's looked into what proportion of a moraine is is superglacial and what is end glacial or subglacial well what is subglacially derived sediments because that would be that would help us think about how to parameterize that model if anyone's done that please do let me know <laughs> okay great thank you um does anybody else have any oh excellent i don't know if somebody else becca or Mahel, do you want to yeah, I can take it. So <clears throat> we have a question from uh, Mike Kaplan. Um, more of a question comment. Uh, with many of the issues, do you think there are issues of spatial and temporal scale? As you said early on, glaciers or their records are a filter. LGM moraines, even with the best beryllium, beryllium 10 precision available, have uncertainties of, of an order of magnitude, order of century or two at least. We do not see glacier weather and paleoclimate signals, even for Holocene decadal uncertainties. Yeah, so yeah, it's a good it's a good comment. Um, and just to think about, so I think the the interesting thing with the modeling is it shows that glaciers can, or you know, some glaciers that that um, a fairly have a fairly high mass turnover can can fluctuate. The ice margin can fluctuate sufficiently that it can you know it build, build, builds distinctive moraines or you know a small number of moraines without an apparent change in climate but the question i guess is whether those are preserved over longer time scales or whether geomorphologically they're interpreted as the same event or not so the simulation the the climate interannual variability simulation which is this one is a very short time scale it's only two thousand years so these moraines may you know they're, they're closely spaced there's three crests but over a period of time if those were deposited and then examined years later, they may start to look like one crest. Um, and it may be that just the one largest crest is identified or their ages, because you know the uncertainty on the beryllium ages may not pick apart different marine building events within the same landform, I guess, particularly if people only take, say, one or two samples from a particular moraine. 
it would be quite difficult, I think, to resolve different timings, you know, three three crests built over 2000 years in terms of ages and without very without taking a large number of samples to date them. So I think it's it's possible this goes undetected. And it's also possible that erosion erosion reduces this landform down to look, you know, to, to basically one landform and moves you know, the, the hill slopes of the moraine, the slopes of moraine collapse a bit and the boulders that are left at the front at the top represent the highest crest rather than every every event. So hopefully that addresses your point. Ah, oh, thanks, Mike. I'm glad that helps. I think the marine preservation is really important because these simulations are looking at short time scales and saying this is the marine sequence at the end. But then as geomorphologists, we're maybe looking at, you know, this happened during the LGM, we'd then go back to it 20,000 years later, it might, you know, a lot of erosion could have happened in that time. I, I guess I could speak up, no one else. Yeah, I, I think preservation is a huge issue. I don't think it's that other climate events didn't happen or the glacier wasn't sensitive to events, but it's just, just missing in a geologic record right mm -hmm. and so it's, it's more of an incomplete record because moraines are not continuous i mean we don't have a continuous paleoclimate record so we have gaps and incompleteness so i think sometimes i think there is a misunderstanding that it's it's just lack of preservation not that the glacier didn't do anything does that oh i guess what you know that i guess i could ask that as a question for you yeah so this is I mean, one of the aims of the modeling is to identify when there are gaps that we, you, the model can point out that you wouldn't see in the field, which simulation is a good example. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess this one could be a good example in that there's, you get, you get periods when the, when the ice margin stabilizes, but doesn't build moraines and this, um, so this, um, and then the moraines are moved down valley um, somewhat from their initial position. So it's, you know, we, I think well, you know, yeah, we don't. All, not all moraines will be preserved or be identifiable, and the yeah, one of the things the model can tell us is where where the, how how many moraines there should be, rather than taking what moraines there are and assuming that's a complete record. Because I think it's more likely that moraine sequences are generally incomplete rather than rather than always complete. Um, but again, it would be useful to look at this over longer time scales to see how that how that um, records quaternary sequences. But we do see in the modeling. Moraines being built and then removed. This is one example, but this is only a small moraine to start with. And it'd be useful to test the time scales over which a moraine is preserved and when when there are gaps. That's great. Thank you, Anne. I think Lizzie's disappeared. <laughs> but um, I don't know if there is any more questions. I feel like I want you to rest your voice now. <laughs> You'll be an amazing trooper. Oh, thank you. Oh, Lizzie's back. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Just <laughs> I don't really know what was happening there. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. So did, did anybody have any questions before we finish? I think Anne's been amazing and, and got through this hour. So I really hope that you're able to get home and <laughs> recuperate. Any I'm other sorry, questions? Uh, before I thought, we my, finish. I thought my voice would hold out better than this. <laughs> no, it looks like that's everyone. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very much to Anne. Uh, really, really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, and um, I'm going to stop recording in just a second. We will obviously post this um, recording uh, to the website as well. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, that, that's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. It was great to have everybody here and some really good questions as well. Thank you.